in the in the case of the northern tribes, there were the glorious there would be a glorious future, but it wasn't going to be for them as a nation. When they were taken away into Assyrian captivity, they never returned. The search for the ten lost tribes is a worthless project. They're gone, and you're not going to discover them anywhere. People have imagined that they that, I mean. Back in the day, there was a book called um, Great Britain and the United States in Prophecy, and they claimed we're the 10 lost tribes. It's just not true. Um, they're gone. But for Judah, it was different. Judah was going to go into a Babylonian exile, but uh, Judah would return. They would repent while they were in exile, and, and they would return to the land, the land promise. But for Judah, the southern kingdom, and, and um, Israel, the northern kingdom, both, there was a promise beyond that. Um, and, and, and that was of the coming Messiah and his kingdom. I'll have more to say about that later. Number four, that was number three, a third principle, and that was uh, keep the basic message of the Hebrew prophets in mind. Number four, note that the prophets use figurative language. Note that the prophets use figurative language. So Amos says not that God is mad, like the bumper sticker, sticker I saw that said, God is coming back and boy, is he mad. But... Um, Amos didn't write, God is mad, he wrote, the lion roars. Isaiah didn't write, God will forgive you, he wrote, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Jeremiah didn't say, Israel has been wrong, but he wrote that Israel has lived as a prostitute. Their language is emotional and graphic, with some reluctance, I'll say that the, their, their language, not the message, but the language that they use is somewhat like the protest songs of the 1960s. Bob Dylan wrote and sang, the times they are a-changing. And, um, and the, the language and the emotion behind those protest songs is something like the prophets. But it's important to keep in mind the figurative nature of, this, of the uh, language they use. And I'll give you an example of why this is important. In Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9, Isaiah says that there will be lions in the Messianic age. Lions in the Messianic age. In Isaiah... Same book, Isaiah 35, verses 8 through 10, Isaiah says there will be no lions, no lions in the Messianic age. So that seems like a first-rate contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. He's making two different points about lions or no lions, and it's figurative. It's symbolic language. And so we need to keep that in mind. I, we make... A, we make quite a mistake when we read everything as literal in the prophets when, when it is so obvious that a, a lot of what they write is figurative. So we need to keep that in mind. Number five, number five. View each prophet as unique. View view each prophet as unique. Um, there's a tendency, I mean, right now I'm, I'm talking about uh, interpreting the prophets and I'm lumping them all together. But, uh, and, and there are certain common things, so you can do that, but at the same time, we always need to keep in mind that the uniqueness of each one. So, for instance, Isaiah, what Isaiah writes is majestic. His view of God and what God is doing is, is majestic. 
Uh, Isaiah was unique also because he prophesied over a very long time, a lifetime. In fact, he prophesied so for such a long period that some people have imagined that one man couldn't have written over that whole period. And they've imagined there are two Isaiahs, and in some cases, three Isaiahs. I contend, uh, just as you see in the book, there's just one. But he lived a long time, and he prophesied a long time. Or Jeremiah. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. I might also call him the reluctant prophet. Prophets in general, many of them were somewhat reluctant, but none none more so than Jeremiah. Um, after all, Jeremiah had a message that was not geared to win friends and influence people. It was, um, well, Jeremiah was kind of a party pooper. Who, who, who wants a prophet that's preaching doom and gloom at your party? And uh, at one point in, in chapter 20, Jeremiah says, Speaking up for God gets me in trouble. So if I just kept quiet, if I just keep quiet and don't speak of him anymore, then I'll be safe. But he says, but when I say that, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire in my bones, and I can't hold it in, and I've got to speak. Or there's uh, Hosea. Hosea was uh, the broken-hearted prophet, broken-hearted over an adulterous wife, and God uses her very adultery as as a um, figurative picture of uh, Israel's unfaithfulness, Israel's adulterous, spiritually adulterous relationship with false gods. Or there's Amos. Amos was a farmer. He wasn't a professional. You might, if, if there were, was such a thing as a professional prophet, it wasn't Amos. Amos was a farmer that was called by God and not just called to prophesy. He was called to prophesy in the other nation. He was from Judah and he was called to go north and prophesy to the northerners. And, um, and his message was stern. He was stern, tough guy. I think Amos, of all the prophets, he was tough as nails. Or there's Jonah. Jonah was well-versed in orthodox beliefs about God. And um, I mean, he could recite them. You see it more than once where he just, he can just, I mean, he can just bring them out. One, two, three, the whole creed. But at the same time, he was disobedient. He confesses that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and then he thinks he's going to run away from him. Ah, ah, that didn't work well. But not only is he, uh, is he a disobedient prophet, but he's a hostile prophet. He was very hostile to the Assyrians in, in Nineveh. He, his dearest desire and dream was that God would destroy them. That's what he wanted. There's no sense of mercy, uh, even, even in the face of repentance. But all these guys are unique in one way or another, but God used all of them to convey his message. That's number four. View each prophet as unique. Or five. That was five, sorry. View each prophet as unique. Number six, look for the author's structural markers. Look for the author's structural markers. As we, as we see throughout the Bible, the authors give us clues to what they're doing in their books. And, and one of the ways they give clues is repeated words and phrases. And some of these, sometimes they're emphasizing a theme, but in this case, what I'm, what I'm emphasizing is sometimes the emphasis is not on a theme, but on the structure. 
So, for instance, in Amos, three times, chapter 3, verse 1, four, verse 1, 5, verse 1, Amos uses the word hear, H-E-A-R. Hear the message. And when you look at it, those are three, those are three sections that he's that he's introducing with the word here. Um, he also a little later on uses the word woe. When you hear woe from the prophets, it's bad. Okay, uh, and he uses that twice to designate sections. And some of the other prophets also use here and woe as well but that those are a couple of the markers that you can find or in amos chapters one and two eight times he uses the words for three sins and for four under hebrew poetry i talked about how this um has a way of intensifying because it's poetry it has a way of intensifying the, me the, the message or what's being said, but also it's a structural inter, uh, indicator uh, because there are these eight, he begins with these eight sections. They're actually denunciations of eight nations and each one of them, and the denunciation begins with for three sins and for four. So that's his marker. Or also back to Amos again. Uh, there, there's a section in Amos starting in chapter 7 and going going on to 9 uh, in which there are five sections. The first four sections are introduced with the words, this is what the Lord God showed me. This is what the Lord God showed me four times and those are four sections. Then, the, But there's a fifth section and rather than th th that phrase for the other four, the final section, uh, Amos simply says, I saw. And notice there is a connection there. This is what the Lord God showed me. It's visual. And I saw. So he's marking it out. Or we talked about Jonah in the book of Jonah twice. We're told that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Came to Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it, and Jonah ran away the first time. That's in chapter 1, verse 1. Th then after he found out running away didn't work out really well. Then in chapter 3, verse 1, God comes to him again and says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and, and this time Jonah goes to Nineveh. But those, those are marking out the structure. Or in Habakkuk, the marker is a little different. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk has three chapters, and uh, in the first two chapters, there is a question-answer period between Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk asks a question, and God answers, or maybe more accurately, Habakkuk complains, and God answers. He starts out by saying, Things are really bad here. Aren't you going to do something about it? People aren't acting right. They're doing evil things. You should do something about this. And God says, don't worry about it, Habakkuk. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of it. I am going to send the Babylonians to beat up on you, and that'll take care of the problem. And Habakkuk says, whoa, the Babylonians are worse than we are. I, that's not what I had in mind. And God says, don't worry about it, Habakkuk. I'm going to send somebody else to beat up on the Babylonians. I'm going to take care of the whole thing. And so th these first two chapters, chapters one and two, have this question answer thing. And then in the third chapter, Habakkuk accepts in faith, accepts God's judgment. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be easy. And in that final chapter, there is uh, what can be called a hymn of faith, in which in faith, Habakkuk says, whatever you do, I accept. 
or um, in Haggai, the prophet Haggai, the it is structured chronologically. This is actually fairly um, unusual for the prophets. Much of what's in the prophets is like an anthology. Like uh, today, if we had a, a, a anthology of poetry or of short stories, this is an anthology. It, or it's most of the prophets are like an anthology, um, and they're not necessarily in chronological order. But in the case of Haggai, it is, and we know this because there are four sections of Haggai, four oracles, and each one of them is dated. And they're dated in order, so we know exactly when they were uh, when they were spoken. Uh, Zechariah. The final section of Zechariah has two main divisions. Each division is uh, introduced with the words "the oracle." Okay, that's number six. Look for the author's structural markers. Number six. Number seven. Examine the historical, cultural, and theological backgrounds. Examine the historical, cultural, and theological backgrounds. Historical. For the most part, well, there, there are two ways to, to look at the historical backgrounds uh, of these books. One of them is biblical, the biblical way, and that is... Uh, for the most part, just go to First and Second Kings. Find out, determine if you can, because you can't always. But if you can, because a lot of times the prophets will say that they prophesied during the reign of these kings, and so you can go back to uh, the Book of Kings and and look for those kings and what's said about that period. Okay, so. Uh, for first and second kings is absolutely invaluable in getting the historical background to these books. But something that can also help us is uh, non-biblical sources, encyclopedias, online references, and so on. And we would go there, not for the biblical stuff, because they're usually not very good at, about that. Uh, well, the biblical encyclopedias may be, but not general encyclopedias. Um, but um, um, but for instance, the background, the context of both Jonah and Nahum uh, is the Assyrians, the Assyrian Empire. And to understand why why Jonah was so hostile. He hated the Assyrians so much. And to understand why Nahum rejoiced, I mean absolutely rejoiced over the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, in order to understand that, we really need to understand something about the Assyrians. And going to general encyclopedias or online resources or so on is a way to get that. Book of Habakkuk that we've talked about. In Habakkuk, God talks about the Babylonians. Well, to understand the context, it's important to go and find out what we can about the Babylonians. So there's the historical background. There is also cultural. Hello. This is Gastroenterology Diagnostic Center calling to remind. Oh, good. You know, all of a sudden it said that there was a an unknown bot that had come into our meeting. And I guess that's what that was. Oh, well. Okay. There are always cultural things that are involved. Um, and um, we can find those throughout the Old Testament. And, and, the, and many of them are reflected in the prophets. And, uh, a couple of examples. In, in Amos chapter 4, verse 1, Amos speaks of the women of Israel 
and he calls them the cows of Bashan. Well, on the face of it, you can probably guess that he's not coming. Okay, can anybody hear me? Strange things are happening with this connection. I can hear you. This okay, is well, I'll continue. I was kicked out. It stopped recording. I'm recording again. We'll see what happens. I, I have no idea. Anyway, there are cultural things. He calls them the cows of Bashan, these women of Israel. It helps us if we know that Bashan was known, well known, for having big, beautiful, well-fed cows. And if you go back to Amos 4 and see what he says about these women, these are the rich women who don't care anything about the oppressed. All they care about is their husband mixing them another drink. That's, that's what he's going against. So this isn't anti-woman, this is anti-oppressive women in that culture. And yeah, he calls them cows. <laughs> Big, beautiful, well-fed cows. Or in uh, Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah refers to Molech. Molech was the Canaanite fire god, and he was associated with child sacrifice. The The, the uh, pagans sacrificed their children to Molech, and unfortunately in Israel, they, uh, they, they, they adopted the practice. And um, so understanding something about that background helps. Okay, historical, cultural, theological. We're still under number seven. This is the theological uh, background. And this is, this is very important, uh, is very important to understand. The, um, sometimes when we hear prophets, I don't know, people hear different things. Sometimes when we hear prophet, we hear, it's all about the future. And I've already said, most of what they said actually wasn't about the future, but some people hear that. Other people, when they hear prophet, they hear rabble-rouser, tear everything down and start over. I'm going to lead you in this new way. Um, but that's not Old Testament prophets that we're talking about. The prophets of the Old Testament were men of the old way. They weren't blazing some new trail. They were men of the old way. In Jeremiah chapter 6, as an illustration of what I'm saying, I think it brings it out. Jeremiah 6, notice verses 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. I set watchmen over you, saying, pay attention to the sound of the, but they said, we will not pay attention. So notice what he says, and, and this is figurative language. He says, I'm standing watching Israel, watching the direction that Israel's going in. I am pleading with Israel, to walk in the ancient paths. And the ancient paths he's talking about are the paths of the law of Moses. That was their original document. 
that was, uh, if you will, their constitution. I mean, that was that. There, this is the original document that where God that God used to form them as a nation, and um, that it and it was the covenant agreement with God, and they were um, they were obligated to keep that covenant agreement, but they had refused to do so. Um, So he calls, he call Jeremiah calls on them. Well, the Lord calls on them through Jeremiah uh, to walk in the ancient paths, but it, but it says they refused. That's not the way they wanted to go. That's not what they wanted to do. So for background, theological background to the prophets, renew your understanding of the Ten Commandments and especially the Ten Commandments in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, if, you, if you get those down well, you've got the theological framework that the prophets are coming from. They're not, their message isn't something radically new, it's actually something radically old. And, and we need to keep that in mind, what their context was. Uh, Grant Osborne, in a, in a quite a marvelous book, on um, interpretation called the hermeneutical spiral um, said, do not impose your theological system on the text. This can turn the text in a direction it does not want to go and, and hamper your search for the truth. And I think that's absolutely right. Okay, that's number seven. Number eight, number eight. Consider the literary forms the author uses. Consider the literary forms the author uses. And I've just I've listed a bunch of these. These don't appear in all in in all the prophets. I mean, this whole list is appears in different prophets. Uh, some of them some of them do appear basically in all of them. And so, Others, not necessarily, but these will give you an idea of the variety of literary forms that they used, and each of these forms, we should be aware of them when we're interpreting the uh, judgment form, and very often judgment and salvation, judgment and restoration, judgment and future hope. That, that sort of thing. But judgment comes through very strongly. Judgment because they've done wrong. Um, another form is promise or hope for the future. Another one is a call to repent. Um, repentance means you were headed in one direction and you turn back and go the other direction. And um, they needed to repent. There are also in the prophets laments and dirges. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term dirge. Sometimes uh, it's worded as fu funeral dirge. But the idea is, and we don't see it as much, we don't see it so much in North America, but in a lot of cultures, the dirge is just part of the, part of mourning for the dead. It's out loud. It's um, it's plaintive, um, crying out because of the loss, and and the prophets often use not just the words but the cadence, the rhythm of a funeral dirge to uh, emphasize the the tragedy and the importance of what they're saying. Also, sometimes the Hebrew prophets include hymns in their work or prayers. Uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic uh, or visionary sections. The book of Revelation in the New Testament is, uh, is apocalyptic and it picks up the images. Many of the images of the apocalypse come from the Old Testament. 
and come from uh, come from the prophets. Also, sometimes the prophets have wisdom sayings. Every once in a while, you will see a proverb or something like you would read in um, in the book of Proverbs or in Ecclesiastes in the prophets. Sometimes there are even letters in the prophets. Um, and sometimes there is what I would call a spiritual courtroom scene. God is the judge. And um, Israel or Judah is the accused. And what they're being accused of is breaking the covenant and doing wrong, violating God's standards. Okay, that's number eight. Number nine, find keywords and phrases. Number nine, find keywords and phrases. Some of some, some keywords will appear in more than one prophet, and others just appear in one. And just as a few examples, uh, and this is one that appears in more than one prophet, there's a, a phrase, uh, the day of the Lord. Um, Lord there is Yahweh, but... Um, and um, this is a day in which God will act in history. And so in a sense, there's actually more than one day of the Lord. When he came to judge uh, Israel, that was the day of the Lord. When he came to judge Judah, that was the, end, uh, that was the day of the Lord. So um, another phrase is, in that day. It's not the exactly the same as the um, day of the Lord, although they're connected. But in that day is a marker. When you see that in the prophets, that's saying he's, he's speaking about something in the future. Another phrase is the Holy One of Israel. This is used throughout Isaiah, and it's fairly, un, fairly unusual. Um, Another one is loving kindness. That's the way it's often translated. Um, or the King James had steadfast love. Um, another one is adultery. This appears in Hosea. And um, in context, there was literal adultery of his wife. But there was a spiritual, a figurative adultery of the uh, people of uh, Israel against God. Also, the word justice is very is very often brought up in the uh, in, in the prophets, um, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that. Okay, number ten. Number ten. Notice themes. Notice. Themes again. Some of these themes will appear in more than one of the pro more than one of the prophets. Others of them are just emphasized by one prophet. So some some of the themes. This is just to uh, give you a sampling. Uh, the word justice again. By the way, and and the context of this is. that the courts were, uh, were oppressing the poor. They were, uh, and, and um, a point that's made is, by the prophets, is that, the, that justice should be based in truth. If he did it, he needs to be punished. If he didn't do it, he shouldn't be punished. But it shouldn't be used to oppress the people you don't like or that are out of favor. Um, another theme, ritual without righteousness is wrong. Ritual without righteousness is wrong. Uh, uh, during a period of time, the, the people of Israel th thought 
that if they if they did the proper rituals, if they made the proper sacrifices, if they um, if they did the did the things that they were supposed to do before God, that He would overlook the fact that they were being unrighteous, and the prophets say, "No, not at all." In fact, your rituals mean nothing to God when uh, when they come out of an unrighteous, unrepentant life. Another theme is the oppression of the poor, and and help for the poor. Uh, they shouldn't be oppressed. Another is the evil of idolatry. We see it in the nations round uh, Israel and Judah, but but the greatest condemnation really falls on them for adopting those practices. Another theme is the uh, Messiah, the coming Messiah and his kingdom. There's also judgment, judgment and salvation, mercy, repentance, knowledge of God. Hosea talks about knowing God, and the Hebrew concept of knowing is a little di is different from the Greek, and we tend to be influenced by the Greek view of knowledge. Um, so when the prophets speak of knowing God, obviously you have to, intellectually you have to know something. But for the Hebrews, knowledge involved experience. And so to know God was not just to know things about God, but it was to, uh, have a personal experience with him. Uh, I, I, another thing that we see uh, uh, that appears in one way or another in the prophets is spiritual adultery. Uh, God is seen as the husband of Israel, and if Israel um, goes after other lovers, false gods, that's a kind of spiritual adultery. Okay, number 11. Number 11. Look for predictive prophecy. Or watch, actually, is the way I worded it. Watch for predictive prophecy. Watch for predictive prophecy. And there are three questions here. I'm going to, I'm going to spend most of my time with one of them. But the three questions to ask when you run into predictive prophecy in the prophets, three questions to ask is, one, is it near or distant prediction? I'll come back to that. Number two, has it been fulfilled? Has it been fulfilled? Number three, is the prophecy, is the prophecy conditional? Is the prophecy conditional? Okay, let's start out with that first one. Is it is the prophecy near or distant? What I mean by that is, and th these are relative terms. So, granted, they're relative terms. Sometimes the the prophecy that's being made is fairly close at hand. It's just right around the corner. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit farther on, and sometimes it's way, way distant. So I, I basically, I'll, I'll talk about, I will talk about how there's a kind of a spectrum of meaning, and I'll, I'll say something about that later. But at this point, I just want, I'll, I'll just use the two categories, near or distant. So examples of near prophecy, predictive prophecy, would be, the Assyrian threat and the fall of the northern tribes. Samaria, Samaria was the capital, and sometimes that's the term that's used. Another example would be the Babylonian threat and the fall of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with your Old Testament history, but 
Assyria threatened both of them. And at one point, it looked like Assyria would, would destroy both of them. But in the end, Assyria only destroyed the northern kingdom. And when it destroyed it, it destroyed it. As I've already said, that kingdom is, did not come back. It's never coming back as a literal physical kingdom. But then, after the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom, they were in turn, the Assyrians that is, were in turn destroyed by the Babylonians. So the new threat came uh, to Judah from the Babylonians, and they in the end were the ones that uh, destroyed the Judah and carried, it, carried him off into exile. So those are a couple of examples of near predictive prophecy. An example of distant prophecy is uh, 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 in, in Zechariah, which is, um, I think, a, a little appreciated book, but uh, is so so great. Uh, there are five passages in Zechariah that point right at Jesus. The last four of those appear toward the end of uh, Zechariah, and they outline the end of Jesus' life in order. So what I mean is, Chapter 9, verse 9, the triumphal entry when Jesus entered Jerusalem is pictured, is predicted. Chapter 11, verse 12, the betrayal. Chapter 12, verse 10, the crucifixion. Chapter 13, verse 7, the idea that Jesus quotes about striking of the shepherd and the, and the sheep being scattered. So see, this is distant stuff. Or Mal uh, Malachi chapter three, verse one, speaks of a coming messenger that will come uh, prior to the coming of the Messiah. Well, that was fulfilled in John the Baptist. Or in Micah, Micah for the most part talks about the fall of uh, nations. But in chapter four, in chapter 5, he makes an un unmistakable reference to the coming of uh, to the coming of the Messiah. But you see, that's from Micah's day to the days of Jesus is a long period. It's a, it's a distant prophecy. Now, sometimes in the prophets, they will have near and distant prophecy in the same context, in the same passage. And let me give you a let me give you an example. In the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, in chapters two and seven, uh, chapters two and seven of Daniel are parallel to each other. And I won't go into all that. There's there there's structural things about Daniel that uh, it's marvelously. Uh, structure, but uh, chapters two and seven are parallel. In each chapter, there is a a, a vision of uh, four kingdoms, and it's the same four kingdoms each time. In chapter two, the vision Nebuchadnezzar has the vision. He doesn't know how to interpret the vision. He tries to get his uh, wise men to interpret it, but he puts in a little. Uh, thing to to make sure that they really can interpret it correctly. He won't tell them what the vision is. They have to tell him what the vision is and then interpret it. It'd be too easy if he tells them the vision, they, they could interpret it however they wanted. Um, and none of them can do it except Daniel because God reveals the, it to Daniel. In that case, in chapter two, the vision involves a statue 
that has four parts to it. The four parts stand for four nations. Uh, the head is the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the Babylonians. Following uh, Babylon, uh, there will be the Persians who destroy the Babylonian Empire. Then you have the Greeks under Alexander the Great that destroys the Persian Empire. And finally, the Romans. And in this vision, there is this rock that comes and hits the statue and it crumbles to dust, and the rock grows into a mountain. And that rock growing into a mountain is the kingdom of God and says something about the nature of the kingdom of God. Then, so notice the kingdoms uh, in chapter two, the kingdoms are um, pictured with a human face statue. And the kingdom of God is pictured as a rock growing into a mountain, not a human face. In chapter seven, there are four kingdoms again, but these four kingdoms, rather than having a human face, have beastly faces. They come out of the sea, which for the Israelites was a place of chaos and uh, evil. Uh, they, they, they come out of the sea. Uh, one is a lion with wings. Another is a bear. A third one is a leopard with four wings. Uh, the last one is uh, what I call robo beast, uh, a terrifying beast with iron teeth. Uh, these four, I believe, are the same four that you have in chapter two. But notice, rather than a human face, it has, they have a beastly face. Then, in contrast to those beastly nations, there is, there is another nation. This time, the kingdom of God, rather than being a stone that becomes a mountain, has a human face. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14. As I looked, thrones, no, no, uh, that's of the ancient of days. I'm not going to read that. Uh, down in 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and la languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that will not be destroyed. In face of these beastly kingdoms, you have the kingdom of God pictured with a human face. There is one who comes with the clouds of heaven, and in the Old Testament, it is God who comes with the clouds of heaven. So he's deity. He is, he is like a son of man. He's presented before the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, and um, he is given dominion and glory and a kingdom. So here's a kingdom, the kingdom of God, in contrast to the human kingdoms, that are beastly. This kingdom, kingdom of God, is going to encompass all peoples, nations, lang and languages. It's universal. This kingdom is everlasting. It is universal and it is everlasting in contrast to the beastly kingdoms that are neither universal nor everlasting. Notice in this, you have both near and distant. Near, you've got the Babylonians who are in charge, but they're eventually going to be bumped off by the Persians who will be bumped off by the Greeks who will be bumped off by the Romans. So there's a whole succession of these. And then in the days of these kings, we're told, you have the God of heaven who sets up a kingdom. So you have a whole, a whole spectrum. Uh, in the prophets, the future comes in stages. You've got the fall of Israel. You've got the fall of Judah. You've got the restoration of Judah back to the land. You've got the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom. You've got the end of the world. In the prophetic vision, the future st 
stage often or future stages uh, often merge often merge in a way that um, well the only, the best way I know to illustrate it I, I I've tried to think about this a lot and the best best way to illustrate it that I know of is if you've ever been um, for instance um, Rocky Mountains or any kind of mountain in this area and where you're you're miles from it and you're looking at the mountains and if you know if you've had this experience you know what I'm talking about the mountains look like it's just one big group of mountains they look like they're one right on top of the other but as you get up close you find there are miles between these mountain peaks and what I'm saying is from the prophetic uh, viewpoint the events look often look as if they are close to each other when actually they're very far apart and um, I, I think that's one way that's one way to visualize it. it it doesn't necessarily mean that these are going to come bang 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 just within a very short time of each other no there may be a very long time between them also remember in this regard um, that the that the prophets are poetic and figurative they use that kind of language it's not literal language and and we should avoid reading into it some, some kind of literal meanings that's not intended okay the I, I said there were three questions I gave them the second question is has it been fulfilled well, the fall of Samaria has been fulfilled, the fall of Judah, the restoration of Judah to the land, all of those have been fulfilled. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus, uh, the Messiah, and his kingdom have come. Um, that, that has been fulfilled, and in a sense is also in, a, in the process of being fulfilled. Uh, Jesus came, he set up his kingdom, but it hasn't entered its final stage yet. It is the already, but not yet, kingdom. And um, so uh, everything, everything in the province has been fulfilled. Most of it has been fulfilled, or it's in the process of being fulfilled. Uh, the, the third question we had is, is the prophecy conditional? For the most part, prophecies in the Old Testament are conditional. When, um, when Judah was told of this coming destruction and this coming restoration, that was conditional on their not repenting to start with, and then the judgment would come, and then their repenting afterwards, and the restoration would come. Without repent, if, if they repented to start with, then the destruction wouldn't have happened. And if they hadn't repented after the destruction, the restoration wouldn't have happened. Uh, one example of this would be in the book of Jonah. Jonah is told to go to Nineveh and preach against it. The message that he delivers is stern and leaves no, no opening for repentance. I mean, it's just. You're going to be destroyed. Yaha. <laughs> Jonah would be happy with that, but then God doesn't do it. The people of Nineveh repent in sackcloth and ashes. They repent, and God relents and doesn't destroy them. So even though the message didn't say it was conditional, in the end, it was conditional, conditioned on their repentance. I think the I think the prophets are an, an exciting, uh, an exciting book or books rather, exciting exciting section, and um, I really commend them to you. They um, they are a good they are a, because a lot of things about them are difficult to interpret. I think a good case can be made to make sure you have um, 
a good um, introduction to the Old Testament that will help you with date, themes, and the, the uh, outline structure of the book. Um, and for details within, I think it would be good to have com a, a good commentary or commentaries that will help you with uh, the cultural and historical and uh, those sort of things in, in the book. Um, I am not sure how um, how much we can interact, but if you have, well, our our time is kind of up. But uh, why don't we why don't we have a prayer? If you have questions, you can ask them, or you can uh, type them out and send them to me. Um, right now, what I'm seeing on the screen is me frozen. <laughs> well. The screen right in front of me, I'm frozen, but up in the corner, I'm moving around. So I don't know what the problem was tonight, but I will I'll check it out and see what we uh, uh, what I need to do to um, to get it online. Uh, let's have a prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word through the prophets. Father, we ask that you would help us to understand, to grow and to um, profit in our own spiritual lives. Help us to embrace the things that the prophets stood for and that you are, you have always called your people um, to do in living for you and living under your rule. And Father, we thank you that we live in the time of Jesus the Messiah. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Good night.